Thanks for joining us online today. Here at House of the Lord, we love to hear what God is doing in your life. So if you have a testimony that you would like to share with us, email us at amen at hotl.church. If this church has impacted you in any way and you would like to partner with us financially, go to our website at hotl.church, click on the right-hand corner to give, or text a dollar amount to 84321. Thanks again for joining us. Enjoy the message. Have a great day. I've entitled this message, this is in our Heart for the House series, and I've entitled, uh, most of you probably remember last week I talked about the heart because I just concerned about your heart. Well, I want to talk about the R's in the heart. You know, if you look at the word heart, there's only one R in the heart, but I want to talk to you about a number of R's in the heart. And, and for, for years there has been these three principal statements um, that have resonated in my heart when it comes to people, and especially as Jesus is building His church with people. Amen? That's the, that's the, that's the materials uh, that, that God has decided to use and to build His church. And the nature and the core values of a church must reflect the nature and the core values of the builder. See, if you, if you look at this, any artist any musician, uh, any, any, with that creativity, uh, whether it's music, design, poetry, re reflects what's in their heart and core values. You can, you can hand two musicians the same instrument and they will have their own kind of take on the sound of it. And, and, and so when I, when I consider this, uh, in fact, when we did our remodel, uh, this last remodel that we did, the structural engineer who's a personal friend of mine, uh, made this statement. He said, it has to be done right if I'm going to put my name on it. And, and that's kind of what Jesus is doing. He's saying, listen, I have a plan. I'm building my church. The gates of hell will not prevail against it. But we have to look at what the core values uh, and, and the nature of the builder is. So these three principal statements, I, I've been preaching this. It's been resonating in my heart for over 20 years as, as, a, lead, as a lead shepherd, as a lead pastor. And the three principal statements are redeem, restore, and release. Redeem, restore, and release. And, and, and redeem would be looking like looking for a classic car. I mean, think about this. You're, you're looking for something, and restore would be the process of restoration and what it entails, and release would actually be putting it into use. It's one thing to, to look for something, to redeem it, then restore it, and then not use it. I mean, it's kind of like it's just art then. It's not something that's, that's useful. So in Luke chapter 15, uh, Jesus is putting these principal statements in a parable after responding to criticism. How many of you love criticism, right? He was responding to criticism by, at the company that he was keeping. He was actually hanging out with some people and the religious leaders of the day we're basically responding and putting some pressures on him. It says in Luke 15, 1 through 2, now the tax collectors and sinners were all drawing near to him, and the Pharisees and the scribes grumbled, saying, This man receives sinners and he eats with them. And part of the issue is the religious leaders of the day did not understand the mission that Jesus was on, they didn't understand the mission. What did Jesus say about Himself? We covered this a little bit, but let me just reiterate. What did He say about Himself? In Mark 10, verse 45, it says, For even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and give His life a ransom for many. And then Luke 9, 56 says, For the Son of Man did not come to destroy men's lives, but to save them. I, I, I wonder sometimes, if the heart of Jesus was known, I mean, we recognize there's just lots of people have no idea what God is all about. They don't understand the heart of Jesus. If they could really sense the heart of Jesus and the fact that what He has for them is life and life abundant, I think it would take down the, you know, the bat shield, so to speak. They lower their armor because sometimes when you talk about Jesus, they're suddenly they're, they're thinking about, well, there's this religious thing that's happening, it's like, no, it's the heart of a Savior for you. And so, 
First of all, in those two passages, there's an active component in being redemptive. Notice that in the two passages, the verbiage of come. It's that He came. So there's something about moving and being active. And then Jesus' response was to tell the story of the lost sheep and the shepherd that would go find it. So we're going to unpack that parable just a little bit. We won't unpack the whole thing. I'll try to narrate it for you. But Luke 15, verses 3-7 through So he told them this parable and recognized, realized this is in response to him receiving criticism by the people that were around him. So he told them this parable, what what man of you having a hundred sheep, if he's lost one of them, does not leave the 99 in open country and go after the one that is lost until he finds it. And go after the one that is lost until he finds it. It's like, He's not making some half-hearted attempt. He's not kind of walking to the edge and kind of going, well, I just can't find him and I'm happy with 99. I mean, come on, 99 sheep is a lot of sheep, right? But he says he does not, he does not, uh, he goes after the one that is lost until he finds it. And then when he's found it, he lays it on his shoulder, rejoicing. And when he comes home, he calls together his friends and his neighbors, saying to them, rejoice with me. For I found my sheep that was lost. Just as I tell you, there will be more joy in heaven over one sinner who repents than 99 righteous persons who need no repentance. So here's my first takeaway. Probably the most important takeaway. Lost people are valuable. If if people in the world do not have a relationship with Jesus, the Bible describes them as being lost. And, and, and when there's something lost that's of value, you want to find it. And what's valuable to God should be valuable to us. I mean, think about what's valuable to God should be valuable to us. Every person that you come into contact with that doesn't know Jesus for salvation is a treasure. I want you to think about this because I believe that it'll, it'll help you start looking at people in a different way. If you, every person that you come into contact with down at the grocery store, the restaurant, the gas station, you recognize every one of those people is a treasure in God's eyes, then it should be a treasure in your eye. It should be a treasure in our eye. And sometimes we, we kind of get a little dull of seeing and heart of heart. See, the heart of the church and that's why we're on the series, is redemptive by nature and actively looking. And you're not going to find that barn fine classic car unless you look for it. You know, people that have, I was thinking about this, people that have a heart to restore stuff are always looking for stuff to restore. Now that was really deep right there. I hope you get that. (laughs) People that have a heart to restore stuff, they're always, they have an eye for it. I mean, they see it. They'll see things that you and I don't see because they 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 just they're, they're bent that way. So so for example, I'm gonna I'm gonna go over here and grab a something real quick. I'm probably stepping out of the camera, and the camera guy doesn't like me anymore. But think think about this. Look at that. Somebody saw that old fan blade and decided they were gonna make a garden ornament windmill out of it. I would have never seen that. In fact, they added something to it that would make it, you know, I, I mean, this is, this is art, y'all. Isn't that crazy stuff? Isn't that crazy stuff? And then, and, then, and then I got one more. Hang on, hang on, don't go away. I got away. So we got this old, we got this old barn wood, and it, it doesn't look like much by itself, but somebody saw it and said, listen, I can turn this into some art. See, that's having an eye, and, and when you see it, you realize, okay, there's a treasure there that's just about ready to happen. Think about that. There's a treasure there that's just about ready to happen. And it happens in the lives of people. You see an old picture frame or an old desk and they see a treasure. You see something that has been discarded and they see repurpose about ready to happen. And there are repurposes about ready to happen all around if we're active and we're involved. That's the heart of the church. Have you ever misplaced something of value and then really, really focused on finding it? Like, you don't sweat the invaluable things, right? 
Uh, but how about your wallet? How about your keys? I mean, listen, have you seen people like freak out when they lose their phone? Seriously, it's a catastrophe when you lose your phone, right? And, and so if it's valuable, you basically go out and out, you know, all out search. In fact, some of the things that, you, that, that aren't valuable, you don't even realize they're lost until you stumble across them, right? So things that are valuable in your life are measured as well. Things that are valuable in your life are measured as well. They're measured by your finances. They're measured by your calendar. They're measured by your time. And we have to recognize that people are valuable to God. And that's where that word redeem is. I mean, He came to save that which was lost. That's the nature. That's the heart. That's the heartbeat of the church. And sometimes our heart doesn't beat the way that it should. And you know what happens is when your heart doesn't beat the way that you should, your body doesn't respond. You have to have that heart because that should be and is in the heart of the church. Or the second part of the parable is the lost coin. I guarantee you when you lose some money, now if it's just a small amount, you probably don't worry about it. But what happens when you lose that? I remember one time there's this, my wife was working for a, you know, doing some books for a gas station and she's on the way to make a deposit or something at the bank and she's got some of this out and the wind catches like a $50 bill or a $100 bill and blows it under a car, right, in the street. And she's actually trying to figure out, do I go get it? I'm going, yes, you go get it. She, I mean, she did. She like, okay, I've got to, so can you picture her? She's on Main Street, downtown, in a little town we, you know, we grew up in. And she's crawling under the car to retrieve something. Why? Because it was valuable. And actually, it wasn't her money. It was valuable to somebody else. It was valuable to somebody else. So the second part of the parable is the woman who lost a coin. She lights a lamp. She sweeps the house. And searches carefully until she finds it. And then once again, the heart of this is to take action because of the value. And the more value, the more that you search. See, we have instruments today that we use to find stuff. We have, like, if you're a fisherman, you got sonar. You want to find stuff. You're hoping to find the biggest fish at the bottom of the water. Or you have, like, maybe a metal detector. Uh, the other day I lost a... I lost a nut off a bolt and I've got this little retractable magnetized tool and I just went and got that thing out because there's an instrument. Guess what? We, you and I, we are the instrument that God wants to use to, 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 to bring the message of redemption. And there's no plan B. There's no plan B. I mean, it's, it's almost like, well, you know, so-and-so will do it. Like God has called us as a church to be the instrument and I appreciate so, uh, so, so much people that have a heart to be on like a search and rescue team. How many of you have ever been on a search and rescue team? I've never been on one, but I guarantee you when I'm out in the mountains and I think about that log that I almost fell over, I'm glad that there's actually somebody ready and waiting in case something happens. I'm glad there are people that have a heart. I mean, and they love it. I'm on that search and rescue team, Okay. And then we find the story of the prodigal son. This is all in response to Jesus being criticized. Who are you having dinner with? Who's, who are you surrounding yourself with? The son who thinks <clears throat> he has it together and he doesn't want relationship with his father or with his brother. And he just wants the goods of life. The word prodigal actually defined means wasted or reckless living. Prodigal, wasted <clears throat> or reckless living. So in that culture, you would wait for the father to die to give you an inheritance. That's proper in their culture. So when the son actually came to the father and said, I want my inheritance, in essence, he was saying, I wish that you were dead. There was no honor there. He, he, he didn't want relationship with the Father. He just kind of wanted the goods of life. So he goes out, he squanders the inheritance, and the story goes that he finally came to himself. At this point of repentance, 
And he knew he needed to get back to the Father. So the parable illustrates that the Father ne never stopped thinking or hoping and ultimately embraced His Son when He returned. So the parable speaks of not only that which was lost being found, that's redemptive, but also being restored and released. Redeem, redeem, restore, release. Those are those three principles that have resonated in my heart because I believe they're in the heartbeat of Jesus. So let's pick up the story in Luke 15, verse 18 through 24. He says, I will arise and go to my father. This is, this is, the, this is the son. He's, he's actually rehearsing what he's going to say because he's come to the end of his end. He's realizing, man, on my own, I can't figure this life out and I'm living worse than the servants of my father. So he says, I will arise and go to my father and I will say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. Treat me. I mean, think about this. He's like, maybe he's in the mirror. And he's, he's rehearsing this. And maybe if I say this just right, the Father will embrace me. My Father will take me back. So, I mean, he's kind of getting his, <clears throat> you know, getting all this stuff together. And then he arose and came to his Father. But while he was still a long way off, his Father saw him and felt compassion and ran and embraced him and kissed him. He did this before the Son got to say anything. It's like he interrupted him. It's like, hey, time out. I know that you got this rehearsed, but wait a minute. I love you. I want to embrace you. I want to make you feel welcome. I want, I, I want you to know that you're home. Well, then the son goes on. The son said to him, Father, I've sinned against heaven before you. He says all this stuff. And then the father says this. Bring quickly. Because you realize the son said to him, Father, I've sinned against heaven and before you. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. And he had more to say. And the father interrupted him. Again, and he said this. He said to his servants, bring quickly the best robe, put it on him, put a ring on his hand, shoes on his feet, bring the fatted calf and kill it and let us eat and celebrate. For my son was dead and is alive again. He's lost and is found. And they began to celebrate. So I want to just unpack this just a little bit more. Once again, notice that the kiss and the embrace came before the son repented to his father. The Bible says it's the kindness of God that leads us to repentance. And then the father spoke three things which I want to break down. The first thing he said was bring the best robe. Bring the best robe. And this speaks to me of the process of restoration. You see, the word here was used to bring the best robe. It, it, it described one that would be worn by a king. It was the robe of the house. It was the, it was the, it represented the kingdom. And the robe would also be used as identification. The robe speaks of learning our identity. And that identity is in Jesus' people. You, we find it all over. Sometimes even believers, we forget that our identity is in Christ. And we act like our identity is what we do, what we own, what we have, our, 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 our mad skills, our education. You know, the, the material things that we have. If we're not careful, we can slide right back into it. We have to remember that our identity is in Jesus. And that's one of the things that the robe restored. Restoration uh, means that we're learning our identity. And in sin, we lost our identity. We lost our purpose. Restoration means that those things that God purposed beforehand are restored. Identity and the loss of identity is huge. Now listen, I want this is a crazy thought. <clears throat> Have you considered that the original purpose of an egg was to fly? Think about that. The original purpose of an egg was to fly instead of being the companion of bacon. I mean, seriously, what do you do? Eggs, bacon, right? But think about it. the original purpose of an egg was to fly. We're called to soar instead of hanging around with pigs. So what was happening with the prodigal. The robe was also a sign of favor. Remember the story of, uh, of the robe that Jacob gave his son Joseph? And Jesus not, so, not only wants to redeem, but He wants to bring you into favor. He wants to bring us into His favor. 
And the process of of restoring also speaks of learning the code, learning the values of the kingdom, how to how to operate and and what are the house rules and 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 it speaks of discipleship and and mentoring and and that's part of the restoration. A lot of times as a church, there's a frustration in me as a pastor and as a leader because we have a tendency to go, okay, so and so they they committed their life to Jesus. They're good. And we don't realize now, wait, there's a restoration process that needs to happen. Because, I mean, how many of you would have a baby and then just say, hey, you're good, man. That's awesome. (laughs) It doesn't work that way. It doesn't work that way in real life. It doesn't work that way spiritually. And yet some people, if we're not careful, they kind of resist the the process of discipleship when discipleship is so important in the church in the lives of people. Mentoring is so important. I, I would not be where I am in a, I mean, my, my life is grown up, you know, just fractured. But I needed mentoring. I, have, I still have a couple mentors in my life. And I really believe this. You should either be both be, be mentored and mentoring somebody. And mentoring is you know, something that you, you learn how to do and because you're saying, okay, I've got some things that... The Apostle Paul said this. He said, while I was with you, I withheld no good thing. He was, he was basically saying, as God is downloading into me, I'm going to download into you. And, and, and mentoring someone is simply just saying, okay, this is what Jesus is, is teaching me. These are some core values. These are some fundamental stuff. How many of you expect your, your son or your grandson to be just a rock star basketball player without fundamentals? Fundamentals. It's about the fundamentals. And that's part of the discipling and part of mentoring. And my heart was that people would embrace it because it, it, it's the very thing that helps you uh, come into that process of, of restoration. And too many people want to bypass the restoration process and get right to the release process. Okay, I'm here. I gave my life to Jesus. I want to do great things for the world. Okay, that's awesome. You will do great things for the world. Let me teach you how to pray. Let me teach you how to read, get into the Word. Let me teach you how to hide it in your heart. Let me teach you how to collectively come together and be part of a community. Listen, this is part of the process. But we have such an instant oatmeal You know, culture. Have it your way. Do it now. And then, the next thing that the Father said was, bring the ring. And this speaks to me of covenant. But it also speaks of authority. It speaks of authority. See, today in our culture, uh, like in the marriage uh, ceremony, a ring can signify or, you know, basically... It it, it signified covenant. Back then, it signified belonging to a household. You had the ring of the household. And what it did was, when a father would give his son the ring, it actually said, son, you are allowed to do the family business. You need to operate. You're going to represent me because of this ring. And this is what, in the parable, what the father was doing. I, I believe that the business of the household of God, the community of believers, is to bring heaven to earth. Now think about that. The ring ring signifies authority. And now you actually, as a believer in the process, you have the authority to bring heaven to earth in every situation. Let your kingdom come and your will be done on earth. Jesus told us how to pray it. Every situation you go in, you should be cognizant of that fact that like, I have the authority to actually pray and bring heaven into this circumstance. Heaven to earth. Why? Because I'm praying according to the will of God. Amen? And when you pray according to the will of God, it says it will be granted to you. It's amazing what you can see happening if you just understand. And Jesus was explaining this. In this parable. And then he talked about the sandals. Put some sandals on his feet. And it speaks of no longer being a slave, but a, but a son, because a son would have sandals on. And it also speaks of being released to the purpose that you're called for. You know, how many of you have different types of 
footwear for different types of activities. You know, you might be wearing some pretty bomb shoes there, girl, but she's probably not going to play basketball in those shoes. Or she's probably not going to go hiking in those shoes. You got specific footwear for specific purposes. The sandals represent being released because you're being a son. And there should be something inside of us that senses great things and that we are created for greater things. Isn't that what Jesus said of those who followed him? Greater things you shall do. There should be something in you that's going, okay, I'm created for some great things. Right? I remember walking in a hay field one time. I was probably seven or eight years old at my grandmother's ranch over in Clark Fork, Idaho, just walking in her big hay field. And I don't know what it is. I mean, I knew I loved Jesus back then. Maybe something that, but I just felt like I'm going to grow up and be super. I'm going to be a superhero. How many of you, I mean, this is crazy. How many of you grew up? I, I know when I grew up, basically, and you're playing, because they didn't have video games there, so you actually had to do real stuff. Um, but I remember like taking a towel and having my mom like close pin a towel on the back of my shirt, yeah. right? Because I'm going to like be Superman, right? No, I'm just weird. I just grew up wanting to be a superhero. Come on, thank you. I want to be a superhero. I wanted to, I mean, there's something in me, but then life happens. Life happens. Sin breaks things down. And you stop believing for the great things. I remember I was so broken as a, as a, as a teenager one time that I went to a, a carnival. And I thought, gosh, it'd be kind of fun to be a carny. Seriously. That's never the dream of God for His kids. I believe there's something that's great in us and that's released in us. And we see that illustrated. Life happens. It says this in Psalm 126, 1-6. When the Lord restored the fortunes of Zion, we were like those who dream. Then our mouth was filled with laughter, our tongue with shouts of joy. And they said among the nations, the Lord has done great things for them. The Lord has done great things for us. We are glad. Restore our fortunes, O Lord, like the streams in the Negev. Those who sow in tears shall reap with shouts of joy. He who goes out weeping, bearing the seed for sowing, shall come home with shouts of joy, bringing his sheaves with him. That's the heart of God. Something great in you. The amazing thing is that God's dreams for us are greater than our own. And our own just kind of get beat down. I mean, if you're here this weekend, maybe you're with us online, I'm telling you, I, have, I, I, I feel in my spirit one of the most destructive things that are happening in this season right now is the enemy is beating down the dream that he's placed in the hearts of God. People are just kind of wanting to check out. They're wanting to give up. They're wanting to like, I mean, think about this. Um, I guess there was a movie a while back called Click. You know, just How, how many of you just love to fast forward? It would be so awesome just to fast forward and be in the next year. But yeah, God is doing something. All things work together for good for those who love God and are called according to His purpose. We are seeing the enemy, I believe this, take advantage of this pandemic. We are seeing the political, uh, political forces take advantage of of this pandemic, but you know what? God is taking advantage of it as well. And He's doing some great things, but you've got to have an eye to see what the dream of God is through this. Be encouraged. Be encouraged. Greater is He that is in you than he that is in the world. Isn't that what the Word says? <clears throat> but think about this. The amazing thing that God's dreams for us are greater than our own. Why do I say that? Because in 1 Corinthians 2, 9-10, through it says, but as it is written, eye has not seen, nor ear heard, nor have entered into the heart of man the things which God has prepared for those who love Him. But then we want to stop right there because you got to look at the following verse. But, but now, one translation says, but now God has revealed them to us through His Spirit. We're in a, we're in a different covenant. We're in a different dispensation. We're in a different release where back then it's like it hadn't entered into the heart of man. But now, by His Spirit, things are different. You should be able to see things 
that you've never seen before, believe things that you've never believed before, dream things that you've never dreamed before because of the Spirit of God, not because of the own, your own thing that you work up, but you recognize God is moving. And the son was being released, so to speak, back in the family business. He said, you got the robe, you got your identity, you got the ring, you got the authority, you got the sandals, just, just move and operate the way that you've been called to do. And sandals also speak of the way that we walk. Amen? My wife, I know she'd be okay with me telling this story because she's told it a long time. Well, she's kind of short. <clears throat> she used to be 5'1", and she'd always include the quarter. 5'1 and a quarter. Now she's just given up and says, I'm 5'1". And it's good. I just love her. But I, I, you know, it was, I think it was about a year ago, so she found these just, uh, maybe somebody gave them to her. Uh, I might have been like my sister gives her shoes and stuff all the time. Just such a blessing. But she gave her these. I mean, these, these dudes were like, I mean, they were high. And she was like, I'm a tall blonde. I mean, she was just stoked. She led worship. She was doing great in them. She was rocking them. And then we were out of church and we're walking across the parking lot and she fell off one of those things and broke her foot. You know what I'm saying? And here's the deal. We're called to walk in a way that we don't fall off stuff. There's specific ways that we walk because we've got... We've been released. We, we, we've been given the sandals of the kingdom. The sandals represent that. A new way and a new pair of shoes. How many of you love a new pair of shoes? Come on. Come on, somebody. You know, even guys like new shoes. I like new shoes. I like new boots. I got like three kinds of hunting boots. And, you know, and the thing is, is that I'm blessed because I got a sister that works at this like kind of not really nice shoe store and then I got my wife we'll go shopping I think we're shopping for her she's shopping for me and she'll say you need to wear those those look great and pretty soon I'm just I've got two or th I got a lot of shoes why because people are always pushing shoes on me <laughs> so I can't complain too much but listen to this Ephesians 5 8 says this but you were once for you were one you were once darkness I didn't say you were once in darkness. I said you were once darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. Walk as children of the light. And then Ephesians 4.17, it says, This I say therefore, <clears throat> and testify in the Lord that you should no longer walk as the rest of the Gentiles walk in the futility of their mind, having their understanding darkened, being alienated from the life of God, because of the ignorance that's in them, because of the blindness of their heart, who passed, being past feeling, have given themselves over to lewdness, to work all kinds of uncleanness with greediness, but you have not so learned Christ, if indeed you have heard Him and been taught by Him, wow, sounds like discipleship, as the truth is in Jesus, that you put off concerning your former conduct, the old man which grows corrupt according to deceitful lust, and be renewed in the spirit of your mind, and that you put on the new man which is created according to God in true righteousness and holiness. A church with a heart to redeem. Gwen, come on up, Hannah, if you're helping me close. A church with a heart to redeem. I want you to to grasp this. It speaks to me of a, a community of believers who are always mindful of the value of people. We, we, we see that person that's out in our community, uh, the person in our family that, that, that doesn't know the Lord, doesn't know the goodness of God, doesn't know the love of God. And I'm telling you, we, we have to change some things in our heart because in God's mind, they are the treasure. They, they, they are the repurposing that's about ready to happen if we move. In fact, that, that the value people, it should be the church. That's our greatest treasure. And we're always willing to reach out. We're always willing to go. We're always willing to search. We're always willing to put ourselves maybe in an uncomfortable position and say, hey, can I just talk to you about the love of God? 
can I talk to you about Jesus? We're always looking for treasure in every person that God has created, and we never give up on people. We never give up on them. A church with a heart to restore. That's a community of people who embrace the broken, the sinner, the addicted, and they release grace because in releasing grace, you've also embraced yourself and understand your need for grace. It's a community of people who are trained and they're ready and they're equipped to mentor, to share life with others for the purpose of growth. And it's a community of believers with this incredible reserve of this grace because that's what it takes to restore. And sometimes the process is incredibly frustrating. And a a church with a heart to release, to, to redeem, to restore, and to release is a community of believers that will not only serve as they've been released, but will make room for others to serve. and be willing to clean up on aisle five because people grow by serving and being activated. Vision is messy because people are messy. Having a heart for the house of God entails knowing what's in the heart of the house. And if somebody comes to me and say, What's the primary things that are in your heart? I'll say redemption, restoration, and release. I believe that God is calling people together. He's, he's healing them. He's equipping them. He wants, to, he wants to empower them and move them into this amazing, Jesus is building something that's going to last for eternity. And you know, He wants to use people that look an awful like you. He wants to use people that look like you and you and me. And if you'll allow him to build the kingdom of God in you, he'll allow you to build the kingdom of God in other people. That's the redemption. That's the that's the restoration. And that's the release. We're just ordinary people filled with the Holy Spirit, doing our best to love what Jesus loves and do what Jesus would do. That's simply gospel. Jesus is building his people, building his church with people like you and I. Can can we just take a moment and, and pray? God, I, I know it's a simple message, but I believe it's a powerful reminder. Thank you for saving us. Thank you for restoring us. Thank you for releasing us. And I pray that, that God, we would have that heart for people. We'd realize the most valuable thing in your heart. It's not property. It's not buildings. It's not bank accounts. It's not material things. The the most valuable thing that you hold in your heart is the value of people that you came to save, that which was lost. I pray we, we take a hold of that, maybe renew it, refresh it, because sometimes we get so jaded We get so wore out. Sometimes we're just like, we don't have room for people. Father, please change our hearts. Because there's a redemptive heartbeat of the church. There's a restorative heartbeat of the church. And there was a releasing heartbeat of the church that it takes that you want to use to build the kingdom, to build your church. Lord, I I would just ask that you would just, by your Spirit, just touch people who are listening or here online with us right now. I pray, first of all, that they would just feel the presence of Jesus. God, they would just feel the presence of the Holy Spirit. And if you're here and you've never surrendered to that redemptive invitation, behold, I stand at the door and knock, and if any man would listen and open the door, I will come in beautiful picture we paint it almost every time the door of your heart and the only handles on the inside and maybe you've heard God on the outside you can hear somebody talking through a door maybe God's trying to get your attention 
but you've never taken that step to say, I want to ask Jesus to come in and be Lord of my life. I need a Savior. And if that's you, and you're here today, and you're saying, I want to make that step, I want you to raise your hand and just let me pray with you right where you're at. If you're with us online, there's a connection card. You can, you can, uh, you can click on the link and just, just write on it. Today, I want, I want to give my life to this Jesus. You're the most valuable person in the heart of God. And He's been on an all-out search to redeem you, to restore you, and to release you into abundant life. Father, we just thank you for your word. Thank you for the challenge. Thank you for the change. Thank you for the transformation. We just give this all to you in the name of Jesus. And they all said, Amen.